This morning's scripture lesson is from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as a king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I said earlier, we are beginning the season of Lent. However, this is not Palm Sunday. So you may be wondering why we've read that particular text, and it has to do with the introduction of a series that we're going to be moving through in the season of Lent. During the season of Lent, we're going to be looking at primarily the events of Holy Week, and we're going to move through the season of Lent through some of those major Holy Week events. And so this first Sunday of Lent, we begin with what begins Holy Week, and that is Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. This morning, I feel a little bit like... uh, Myra in the movie Hoosiers. If you've seen the movie Hoosiers, Myra is the, uh, one of the high school teachers who, um, after a little while, develops a friendship with the new coach, Norman Dale. And at one point, once they've kind of worked through the complications and difficulties of their early acquaintance, she confides in Coach Dale that she really doesn't understand all the enthusiasm around sports. She says, you know, when my brother was playing, our whole lives revolved around that schedule, his basketball schedule. We never, ever missed a game. No matter how far it was, no matter what the weather was, we were always there, always present. Everything got put on the back burner for that. And if we would win, it was a great celebration. And if we would lose, my mother would walk the floor all night so upset about the loss. And she says, you know what? I don't get it. I don't understand it. You know what? I have to say, I have tried to understand it. I have tried to understand myself around it. And I don't get it either. I really don't. Um, You know, it makes more sense to me if you have a child that's playing or a grandchild that's out on the court playing, whatever the sport it happens to be, then you've got a little personal investment there. And I can understand that. That makes sense to me. But, you know, when I go to an SIU ball game, and I sit down, I don't know the players. I mean, I kind of, I know who they are, but I don't know them. It's not like we're buds or anything. I mean, I've met a few of them, but we're not friends. I've, I've met Coach Henson, but again, you know, just, you know, we might recognize each other if we ran into each other, but we're not friends. I don't know these people. And yet I go through this little ritual every time I go to a game. If we stop by the concession stands, I get a Pepsi, maybe I'll get a little popcorn, I go to my seat, I sit down, the players are warming up, and I sit there and I say, Larry, just enjoy the game. It's just entertainment. Don't get all worked up about this. This is, it doesn't matter. It's not that important. And so I just sit there and I lay back in my seat and I just sip my soda and I try to eat a little popcorn and then they sing the national anthem and then there's the tip-off and we get the tip-off, we run down the floor, we shoot a three-pointer and we make it. I'm on my feet yelling, yes, yes, it's so great. And then in a few minutes later, one of the refs make a bad call. And at that point... I question their eyesight, I question their wisdom, I question their competence, 
I always think if that had been Rick Rungy, he would have never made that call. <laughs> and pretty soon it's halftime, and I am exhausted. I feel like I've been out on the floor playing the game. And I think, and you were just going to sit here and enjoy the evening. It doesn't really matter. I don't understand it. I try to understand it. And I can't really understand. Maybe it's the crowd. Maybe I just get caught up in the crowd. I don't know. Maybe it's I'm really a lot more competitive than I like to believe. That's possible, I guess. Maybe it's just all the excitement, but you know, it's just amazing how I and many of the people around me get caught up in this experience. And you know what's really interesting is that no matter what the score is, the buzzer sounds at the end of the game and everybody grabs their coats and walks out. Hey, how are you? How was your week? All that kind of stuff, you know. It's like we don't even remember what we just did for the last two hours. But it was so important 45 seconds ago that we would have practically killed somebody. I don't get it. And I wonder, what if it really did matter? What if it really was important if we won or if we lost? What if significant things were really going to happen in my life in the lives of people I love and care about based on the outcome of the game? What if winning meant that I would no longer have to live in a state of constant oppression forced on me by a foreign government that I hated? What if winning meant that that was all going to go away and I would never have to worry about that ever again? What if winning meant that the constant fear I lived with seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for myself, for my family, for my loved ones? What if winning meant that constant fear is gone. I will never have to worry again and be afraid in the way that I am now. What if winning meant that the life that I dream of for myself for my family, for children and grandchildren. The life that is only in my imagination would become a reality. What if winning meant that my life and the life of everyone I know and care about would be radically changed for the good, radically changed for the good. I wonder if that were true, I wonder how much I would cheer then. I can't even imagine it. I mean, you would, you would cheer with all the enthusiasm that you could possibly muster if all of that rested on the winning. You would... You would sing the fight song at the top of your lungs. You would form a parade to greet the team as they came into town. And you would shout and with joy because you know this is the unbeatable team. There is like one guy on this team who is just like super amazing. If half you've heard about him is true then losing is just not an option. This guy is just incredible. And everything, everything is dependent upon the winning, but you're not worried about that because all he has to do is play. 
And when he plays, he always wins. And when he wins this time, the world and your life is going to change for the better. Why would he come if he didn't come to play? There's no chance we can lose this one. All he has to do is play, and we win. And the world is altogether different. How would you feel if he chose not to play? Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we move into this season, Lord, with you this morning of trying to understand who Jesus is, the path that he took, how it was understood by those who gathered with him, and how it was misunderstood by them as well. To understand the tension of their lives and the disappointment of the cross. May your spirit move with us as we move through these days and weeks of Lent. Inviting us into your presence. In your name we pray. Amen.